All right, so I put single piece lenses in almost exclusively when I'm doing cataract surgery. When I use a three piece lens, um, usually the posterior capsule is open and I need to, um, you know, put in that lens into the sulcus. The difficulty for me in using a three piece lens is that I want to use the cartridge. My techs are more familiar with getting it in the cartridge and, and yet this issue of having to twist the cartridge so that the haptics go in the right place is somewhat or has been somewhat of a mystery to me. So um, in order to figure that out for myself, um, I have gone through some thoughts and I have put them down in some drawings here. So what I have here is the, uh, you know, sort of a sketch of an IOL um, with its optic and its two haptics. And um, I've got these words rigid written on here. And I, I think that's what helps one to understand um, why the situation is the way it is for because this is rigid when the optic gets bent or gets made into a taco configuration as it goes down the cartridge then this haptic will assume a different position. Let me go ahead and um, bring a lens that I have cut out over here okay and so again sort of this thing just cut out and um, then when you slide it into the cartridge you slide it over there so that the haptic follows the etchings on the cartridge then as you push down here so that the lens bends forward makes a taco like that and then what I hope you can see is that as this lens is twisted like this, or as I should say, as it's made into the taco configuration, look how that optic-haptic junction causes the optic, or probably the haptic, to go the, the wrong direction, okay, or a different direction, so that once it's fully in position inside that cartridge, the haptic is 180 degrees away from the way that it should be going into the eye, or situated in the eye eventually. That's the reason why you've got to then twist the cartridge over so that you get that leading haptic again in the configuration that you want. And when uh, if you don't twist it, then this leading haptic points posteriorly, which in my case is almost the only time that is when the capsule is open, and I certainly don't want it pointing back that way. So that's why you twist it around, and then you slide this leading haptic in between the anterior capsule and the iris, so that as you uncoil it, the iris and the anterior capsule provide some support to keep this haptic from flipping back again where it shouldn't and then um, it eventually as you twist it it comes all the way like this and then you can use a, um, a, an angle McPherson to put this in in a trailing fashion. So hopefully that demonstration makes the re rationale for turning the cartridge uh, make some sense to you. Now we're going to move on to a case and I uh, put a little yellow circle around the faint opening in the posterior capsule and that is what is really forcing the use of a sulcus lens. Now you will see me begin to put viscoelastic into the sulcus. I'm going to freeze it right here because there's a teaching point on finesse which I actually don't demonstrate here but the lack of finesse I think can help you see what the point is. I've put on two graphics now. One is a blue arrow which shows where the cannula is and the other is a yellow dashed line which shows where the edge of the keratotomy is. I will actually move the yellow line off so you can sort of see the faint position of where the keratotomy ends. And now I'll put the yellow line back on. Watch how that gap closes and how the eye moves way up superiorly. And look at all the stria that are in the cornea too. And all of that sort of goes away as I bring that cannula back into the middle of the keratotomy. Is that amount of motion really a problem? Probably not, but the patient is more aware of it. And um, I think if you remove the cannula and then reinsert it so that the eye maintains a more central position, the whole surgery is more finessed and more consistent. Next we need to enlarge the keratotomy since usually I don't want the cartridge to go all the way in the eye but in order to place the haptics properly it needs to be to properly enlarge the wound. I'm going to freeze it here and um, you can see that I've used the 0.12 to stabilize the eye. Again that's to keep it very central 
and to allow me some counter tension. So first we need to advance the keratotomy, pardon me, the keratome, and we'll go straight in and then we're going to turn it sideways. I'll put my yellow line back on here and you can see how the sharp edge is approximated to the edge of the keratotomy and then I will pull it out of the eye so that it cuts on the outstroke. Then we'll repeat it again on this side. Again we're turning it so that the edge of the blade is right up against the keratotomy. Now watch what happens. You can see that the cartridge is not going all the way in. If it's not, then we've got to enlarge the wound some more. So this time we'll use a Connor wand and it will hold the eye with it. Go all the way in, cutting on the outstroke, cutting on the outstroke there, making sure it's large enough there. Now we'll get our cartridge again. And still not going in real easily. We'll get a counter wand for some counter traction. And I think it will go in this time. There. Now it's all the way in. And then you can see how we twist it all the way around like I showed at the beginning of the tutorial. And then we put that leading haptic all the way up into the sulcus. And then we begin to twist that cartridge. The leading haptic is being held in place by the capsule and the iris. And then we untwist it, the whole optics out, and we'll continue to twist so that the trailing haptic gets put into the proper configuration. What is absolutely crucial is that the lens haptics are in the sulcus. So I will use the Connor wand at this point, sort of verify that the leading haptic is where I want it, get the optic sort of sitting where it needs to be, and then after that I will use an angle McPherson to put the trailing haptic into the sulcus. I'm going to freeze it here also, and I want you to pay attention to where the handle is on this angle McPherson. It's pointing off to the right side of the screen. That way as I lift it toward the microscope it causes the bend of the haptic to point posteriorly. If I had grabbed it so that the handle of the angle McPherson was pointing to the left of your screen as I raised that upwards it would cause the bend of the haptic to come toward the corneal surface rather than to behind the iris which is totally where it needs to go. And I'm going to freeze it right here too because at this point I have a very good grip on the trailing haptic but I haven't let it loose and if you can see the haptic is still in front of the iris. It hasn't gone to the sulcus yet. I am going to apply gentle posterior pressure and it will pop over the edge of the iris and as you watch that happen you can gain confidence that it's not going into the capsule but into the sulcus. And now it's going to pop behind. I'm going to slow it down and I froze it. It's so quick you can almost not see it. Now I'm going to pull it back and I will freeze the frame and put an arrow on it and you can see how the pupil is being deformed by the angle McPherson and that trailing haptic. Moving right on to the next teaching point we're going to now capture this optic. So I'm going to pull the optic and it pops right under the capsule and I'm going to push it and it'll pop under and see how now the capsule erectus is not round but it's oval. That's the way it should look when you have the optic in the bag and the haptic in the sulcus. So at this point we have a recompartmentalized eye with the optic, you know, causing a, the, the posterior segment to be rather isolated from the anterior segment. Now we'll use the INA handpiece 
um, to go ahead and vacuum out the viscoelastic that was in the front. Um, if there was vitreous here, you would expect to see the iris moving or the lens would be moving one way or the other, but it's very, very stable and uh, there's no evidence of vitreous at this point at all. Now we're going to hydrate the wound. It goes white because the fluid separates the collagen fibers, scatters light. And we'll hydrate the para a little also. And this case didn't need any sutures and we still used intracameral antibiotics and the case turned out quite well.